Welcome everyone uh, to Protecting Your Brand on Amazon, How to Regain Control on the World's Number One E-Commerce Site. My name is Brian Beck. I'm going to be your host today. Um, I'm with Nseba and we have Track Street and KJK joining as well. Thank you all for joining us today. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. If you have questions, you can place them in the Q&A box uh, on the right. We'll get to as many of those questions as we can. We have an enormous amount to share today. We're going to be going fairly quickly through this. There will be a recording and a uh, presentation, a copy of this presentation will may, be made available to you afterwards, uh, as well as an on-demand version you can share with your colleagues. Um, so stay tuned for that uh, after the, um, after the uh, webinar is concluded. Uh, so uh, this webinar, again, is being recorded. So <clears throat> with that, I want to jump right in because we have a lot to share today. Um, your speakers today, my name is Brian Beck. I'm the managing partner of a company called Inseba. Uh, Inseba runs Amazon programs for branded product manufacturers, B2B and crossover B2B to C uh, products. Um, I'm one of the founders and managing partners of the company. I'm also the thought leader, um, head of a thought leadership series, co-founder of a thought leadership series in B2B e-commerce called Master B2B. And I wrote a book about all this stuff called Billion Dollar B2B e-commerce available, of course, on Amazon. So that's me. John, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is John Groza. I'm a partner with KJK. Uh, we're a full-service business firm, and I co-chair our brand enforcement e-commerce practice. Awesome. Alex? Yeah, I'm Alex Jones, uh, also at KJK, John's co-chair. Um, you know, we work with brands across a variety of industries to help them uh, navigate the various legal issues that come about with e-commerce sales. Fantastic. And Michelle? Michelle Daling, I'm the Director of uh, Operations here at Track Street, so I help manage our Brand Protection Managed Services team, as well as all of our operations and thought leadership here. Well, fantastic, guys. We've got such a great group of people joining us also from the industry and, um, <clears throat> and across all different kinds of companies. I was looking over the, uh, the folks who are joining our, our session today, and you know, we've got a, a really great group of experts also today to talk about all these different issues related to brand control on Amazon. Here's our contents. We're going to start by talking a little bit about Amazon trends and buyer behaviors and all the incentive that Amazon creates for folks to come in and um, sell products on the channel, how brands lose control of Amazon, brand registry, not the complete answer. We're going to talk about a couple of other things. Uh, Michelle's going to share with us on uh, transparency and some other programs Amazon has, regaining uh, control and mitigating channel conflict, which is a big issue for many of our clients. Uh, and then finally, putting Amazon to work for you, uh, not against you. Uh, Q&A, we'll, we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A. We may not get to all of our questions today. If we don't get to some of your questions, we'll, we can uh, certainly have a follow-up after this as well. So let's jump into uh, some of the trends about Amazon. Now, many of you on the uh, call today, on the webinar today, know Amazon as, its, as a B2C Entity. In fact, it's responsible for almost 50% of US e commerce, um, $482 trillion or billion dollars, really an enormous um, uh, uh, and pervasive channel for e commerce in the US. And of course, you know, from a prime household standpoint, absolutely enormous, almost uh, or over 70% of US households have an Amazon Prime membership within them. It's really um, become the most successful loyalty program in the history of. Of humankind, I think, um, but Amazon again becomes it has become a dominant force, but it's also become a dominant force in B two B. A lot of companies don't realize this. Amazon uh, Amazon CEO Andy Jassy finally spoke about this in an earnings release in in April, where he said they're just scratching the surface in B two B at thirty five billion dollars in revenue. So, <clears throat> just as much as Amazon has become a force in B two C, they are here in B two B. Many of our folks on the call or on the webinar today uh, are, are B2B companies. So as we think about, you know, the same kind of dynamic shifts that have occurred in B2C, it's coming and it really is here in B2B. And what's driving a lot of this is today's buyers are, in fact, Amazon natives. In fact, 60% um, of millennials now say that Amazon is their most preferred shopping channel, bar none. Two-thirds of millennials are making half or more of their online purchases on Amazon, Almost 100% use it for at least part of their online shopping. And from a B2B perspective, these millennials, those born between 1980 and 2000, will be 75% of the global workforce by 2025 in just two years. And these folks are moving into B2B procurement roles. So 
this is <clears throat> the point we're making here is this is not just about consumers anymore. It's also about the B2B buyer. Um, and so, you know, companies have to be aware of this. Now, this is the question. Do you know who all of the resellers are who are selling your products today on Amazon? I'm going to pop a quick poll here and you can answer this. I would like you to answer this question. Let me get to my polls quizzes here and launch this. Hang on. So go ahead and go ahead and share your answers here. Do you know all the resellers that are sell your, selling your products on Amazon? Yes or no. I'm going to share the results here. We're getting them in. Uh, we get about halfway there. Keep going, guys. Hit those buttons. 70% of you. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. I'll give you another five seconds or so. Um, we did a study on this at Enceba where we pulled several hundred manufacturers and asked this question. And I'll show you the answers there as well. Give you just one more second to type in your answers. You're almost there. I still see a few coming in. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, the fact of the matter is a lot of folks don't. And let me share the results of this poll here what you just voted on, 91% of you on this call do not know who all the resellers are that share your that sell your products on Amazon. And when we did this poll in um, uh, and broadly across several hundred manufacturers, we found a similar result. We asked the question, are resellers selling your products on Amazon? Almost 70% said yes. Do you know who all these resellers are? Over 70% said no. Over 90% of you on the webinar today said, said no. And this causes or can cause um, what's called channel conflict. Now, this is, uh, I use this, uh, this, this world source of, of, of intelligence, Wikipedia, for a definition here. Channel conflict occurs when manufacturers, brands, most of you on this call, disintermediate their channel partners, such as distributors, retailers, dealers, and sales representatives by selling through their products directly to buyers through general marketing methods and or over the internet. I like to extend this definition to include Amazon resellers, because when you don't have control of Amazon in terms of who's selling your product there, it can cause channel conflict just as much as you selling directly potentially can cause uh, channel conflict. So you've got all these folks out there you don't know. The way they often compete is on price. They drop the price because it's the only uh, really differentiation they have as a company. So this is a real issue. And our goal today is to give you some tools and tactics to address it. So with that, we're going to talk about how losing control happens. And uh, we're going to turn this over to John for an example, John at KJK. John, you want to hop in here? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Um, so what we have here is an example, um, very typical to what we often see when helping our clients with these issues. We have a premium brand, Cascade, uh, and then we have an example of, of a couple, what we call unauthorized resellers. Um, we have NB things. Chances are this company doesn't specialize in selling dishwasher soap. They probably sell whatever they get their hands on. And as Brian stated, the only way they can differentiate themselves is through, um, you know, advertising that for a, a probably a very low price or a lower price than you'd like to see as the brand. And um, so who are these that they have oftentimes not consistent or low um, customer rankings, as you can see here with MB things, as well as this God is perfect example. Um, unauthorized resellers are brands you often, as we've seen from the poll results, don't know. They are leveraging your brand, infringing on your intellectual property rights, your trademarks and your copyrights. They are oftentimes damaging your relationships with your authorized distribution channels, your authorized resellers, and they're cutting into your profit margins. These are brands you have no control over the over these entities. Uh, we have no oftentimes no visibility as to how they're storing your products how they're shipping your products, um, or whether these products are even the legitimate article. So they can be ex extremely problematic. And, um, you know, we have clients who have a few very disruptive ones or even hundreds of disruptive resellers, depending on the product price points. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no question, John. It's good. That's a great example. So Alex, you want to, you want to talk a little more about how this, how, the, how does this actually happen? Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Um, when we work with clients, basically the main thing that we see when you have a, a brand that has, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of unauthorized sellers on a listing, it's, you know, we come to find out they don't have a good control over their supply chain. And, and what do I mean by that? Basically, do you understand how a product goes from you, the brand, down to the end user? And what we find is that brands that have a lot of unauthorized resellers, they don't know, they don't know that process. 
And usually that boils down to two main things. And we say that's lack of agreements and uh, lack of tracing controls. And so first one, distributor reseller agreements. This is what it sounds like. These are agreements with your trusted partners about, um, you know, for buying and selling your products. Uh, importantly, these agreements should, di should dictate how you can sell, where they can sell, all those things. And you should also have audit rights based on so you can get a better, you know, more granular with respect to who they're selling to. Um, when we talk about tracing controls, this can be anything. This can be barcodes, batch or lot codes, something that if you were to do a test buy on a product, you could somehow trace it back to where that product started from. Um, when companies have those types of things in place, that's a control over their supply chain. That's they can see where the product goes from manufacturer to end user. And that if there happens to be a leak, they're able to plug it much quicker, more effectively without it getting out of control. It's those brands that don't have those controls. That's when you that's where you get the unauthorized resellers in the you know dozens, if not hundreds. Interesting. Okay. So yep. And we'll dive more into the mechanics of getting those things in place a little bit later. Michelle from Tracture, you want to talk to us about the business model of Amazon itself encourages competition, doesn't it? It does. Amazon is a customer centric company. They mm -hmm. actually, the more competition they have on the platform, the better it is for Amazon themselves, because this is a huge source of revenue for Amazon to have these third party sellers within the platform. So 60% of all paid units, which are both physical and digital units, that are sold on Amazon are sold by third party sellers. So that number has come up dramatically over the years. Uh, when this chart starts, it starts in uh, 2007, which it was just over 25% and now it's over 60%. So over half of everything that's being sold on Amazon is sold within the third party marketplace. Wow. There are over two and a half million active sellers in North America alone on the third party marketplace. And that attributes uh, roughly $117 billion in revenue oh. for Amazon. So, okay. which represents about 23% of Amazon's total revenue for everything that Amazon sells. That's inclusive of mm -hmm. advertising, marketing, Amazon web services. 23% is from that third party marketplace only. Wow. Um, and Amazon takes a cut of everything that's sold on the third party marketplace. Those referral free fees are anywhere between six and 45%, depending on category, which does not include any of the FBA storage fees, any of the shipping fees, packing fees, or any of the pay-per-click advertising and marketing within the platform. It really is the penultimate example of an open marketplace, isn't it, Michelle? Because it's just it really encourages <clears throat> sellers to get products and compete, uh, and which just really drives the pricing down from what I've seen. It does. And Amazon doesn't want to do anything to limit that competition, obviously, because it's a huge revenue driver for them. Right. Uh, so this just so shows again, like from 2018 to 2027, a little bit more about the net e-commerce sales for Amazon, and that's 1P versus 3P. So you see that that blue line is the first party or the uh, vendor central sales, and the third party sales or the seller central sales, sales are that black line. So you see that it's growing at a much higher rate it's currently uh, double what the sales are through Amazon's 1P or Thunder Central channel are. And what's really interesting about this, Michelle, I'm going to define in just a moment what 1P and 3P is. It's it, Amazon itself um, really is leaning heavily into the 3P model. To, you know, a lot to the profitability point you made earlier. They don't have to invest in inventory. They don't have to invest in, um, you know, in other things. Where 1P is where they actually own the product. I'll define that in a moment. Um, but the, but the model itself yeah it does encourage folks to get in and sell the product and drive drive the price lower, and Amazon likes that competition. To your point, let me define for us what these two selling models are. So if you're going to sell your products on Amazon, you actually have different choices, and those choices matter as it relates to how much control you have over the channel. There's two ways to sell your in, in the simplest the most simple terms. There's two ways to sell your products on Amazon. Vendor Central, 1P or First Party, there's three names for it, of course. <laughs> um, this is where you sell your product like you would a traditional to a traditional um, buyer, distributor, uh, retailer, et cetera, where you're selling directly to Amazon on a purchase order. You ship to Amazon's fulfillment center. Amazon owns the product, takes, takes title to the product. They put it in their warehouses or fulfillment centers in Amazon speak. Fulfillment 
Uh, they fulfill the end customer. You have some marketing and merchandising opportunities, but at the end of the day, they own the product. They set the price. Seller central or third-party selling, 3P, in this model, you set up your own storefront as a seller. Amazon still processes the order, but the vendor, you, ship the product to the end customer, or you use something called fulfilled by Amazon to make the product prime eligible and then ship it to the end customer. Merchandising and promotion and marketing opportunities still exist here, but we see many manufacturers moving towards this model, or if they're starting uh, selling directly on Amazon, they're going to start often with the seller central model. Why? Principally because you can manage the price that you offer the product for on Amazon. You're setting it, not Amazon in this case. So the, it offers greater control of also product assortment that's offered on Amazon, how much inventory you stock into. Seller Central um, offers the most control you can have in terms of selling on Amazon if you're going to sell directly. Um, and it provides this control. It's your storefront. Um, you have greater control of the assortment, inventory, price, brand content, et cetera. It's typically more profitable also than the 1P approach. And we have some clients that take a hybrid approach. 1P, 3P are also possible. And potentially you can shift from one pro, from 1P to 3P. We've taken a number of companies down that path over, our, over the last few years. Dynabrate is an example of one of those companies. Uh, Ron Viders, the director of marketing, gave us this quote. The Amazon 3P approach is a slam dunk. It's helped us to communicate better with our distributors. It helped us to deepen our relationship and become more strategic. They should have done this five years ago. They were a 1P. They moved to 3P um, and have had uh, some nice success with it. Again, we're not. this is just one element of channel control, but we raise it because it's important to recognize that you know this selling method provides you with uh, with a better opportunity to actually manage the channel effectively. So let's say you're one of those 92% of people on the call today that said they don't know all their resellers. You know, you may feel like you have no control. It's the Wild West. Um, so how do we go about, you know, sort of regaining uh, control? I'm going to turn this over. I think, Alex, you're going to start this one. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Sure. So in, when we're talking about regaining control in this context, what we're really talking about is, is getting rid of those unauthorized resellers. It's making sure that your ASINs, your listings have either either you or your authorized resellers. Um, so that begs the question as to how do you remove these authorized unauthorized sellers? From the legal perspective, our claims in this realm are based on intellectual property law. Um, they are based on the idea that the unauthorized sale infringes on a brand's trademarks, infringes on their copyrights. So, you know, the first thing that any brand needs to do is get your intellectual property house in order. Uh, that means register your trademarks, register your copyrights, make sure that you have the ability to... Um, that you can show that you own these as intellectual property and you have the ability to enforce it. Um, so that way we're going to make claims like trademark infringement, trademark dilution, unfair competition. Uh, I think it's important to note that our claim is not based purely on the fact that this, the, the reseller is unauthorized. And the reason for that is because of what's known as the first sale doctrine. Um, Brian, if you go to the next slide. Yep. So you, you may have heard of the first sale doctrine. Um, basically, anytime you tell a reseller to stop selling, they're going to come back at you with, no, I can do this first sale doctrine. And at its core, the first sale doctrine basically means that after the first sale, you are allowed to then resell that product and it doesn't constitute trademark infringement. Um, so that is generally correct. That's not a wrong position that resellers are taking. But there are exceptions to the first sale doctrine. It is not absolute, and they just don't have blanket authority to resell however they want. Um, the main exception that we use in this space is what's called the material difference exception. Uh, at its core, what we, what we need to show is that products sold by unauthorized resellers are, quote unquote, materially different than products sold by authorized resellers or the brand itself. Um, if you have a situation where it's they're selling counterfeits or used, return, damaged goods, that's that's easy. Um, that's a very clear physical difference. Where I think brands struggle with and where you know we can assist here is that this theory also applies to non-physical differences. This theory can be applied to products that are bought from the manufacturer. They are genuine to start. But we're, we're, we make the argument that by the time they get to the end user, they are materially different. And the two main avenues going about these non-physical differences are 
quality controls and warranty protection. Um, quality controls are what they sound. It is a brand's quality control for how you ship, handle, store, um, do anything with your products that in order to be authorized, you have to follow these quality controls. The idea being that if you are selling products without these quality controls, they're materially different. Similarly, there's warranty protections. So again, if a product sold by an unauthorized reseller, it doesn't come with a warranty. If it's sold by the brand itself or an authorized reseller, you get a warranty. So you have a materially different product, one with a warranty, one without. So these quality controls and warranty protections, these should be built into those reseller and distributor agreements that we talked about. That way you can show, hey, I have contractual relations with people that they have to follow these quality controls. You're not following them. Um, a lot of times we also advise our clients to put standalone policies in place. So a standalone quality control policy that's it's out there. It's in the public. It just shows that, hey, this is what you have to do in order to become an authorized seller. We also recommend having you know, a warranty policy that's standalone. And it says it makes very clear that, hey, in order to get the benefits of this warranty, you have to buy the product from an authorized seller or the brand itself. So when you combine those things, when you have your intellectual property house in order, when you have distributor and reseller agreements that have these quality controls, these warranty policies, and you have all these policies in place, you set the foundation for yourself to be able to go after these author unauthorized resellers to have valid legal claims to get them off the listing. So, you know, once you do that, then you can start trying to go identify and take down those resellers. Hey, Alex, we have a question here from Julian Frere. He said, he asked, what, what about money back guarantees or after marketing programs restricted to the manufacturer would that would that be part of um would that be part of it too could you create yeah so i'm using uh, warranty here you know somewhat colloquially um it's the idea that the product comes with a suite of services so whether that's like a product guarantee or you know a money back offering something along those lines the key here is not so much what you're calling it but it's that you're offering a suite of services that are only applicable to those products when bought by the brand or its authorized resellers. And that suite of services does not come when you are buying from an unauthorized reseller. Got it. Makes sense. All right, John, I think you were going to take us through this. Yeah. So the next step really is identifying who these unauthorized resellers are. Now, Amazon did change their policy um, in the last couple of years to require these three piece sellers to identify themselves to some extent. Um, but oftentimes that information is inaccurate uh, or misleading. Um, we have a screenshot here on this slide of a, a typical kind of fly by night reseller where just, you know, can, on its face, you look at the address, you can tell it's, it's not legitimate. Um, so how do we go by identifying and determining the actual location and identity of these, of these three P unauthorized sellers? Not always as easy as it sounds. Um, oftentimes, we're working with our clients, internal e-commerce folks, or a, a service like Track Street, to um, kind of tee these up. Here are the here are the sellers we want to go after. But then finding um, you know, actually accurate email addresses and physical addresses is sometimes a different story. Uh, what we do have at our disposal is a tool called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act subpoena or the DMCA subpoena. So this is a uh, subpoena that's served in a federal court and we serve it upon Amazon itself. Sometimes we will serve it upon Amazon's outside counsel as well, which can help kind of expedite the response process there. And this is not something that's really controversial. Amazon responds to these as a matter of course and business all the time. It's not something that's going to you know anger Amazon or turn them against you. This is something that they're required by law to respond to and, and provide the accurate seller information um, to the best of their knowledge. So that's that's one tool. If, if we can't find it by our own due diligence, we can we can serve uh, the DMCA subpoena and um, we can you know find out the physical and then oftentimes email addresses of these kind of nefarious sellers. And John, this is specifically in the U.S., right? This is U.S. law. Specifically in the U.S., uh, we're assisting a client right now um, where they have a similar issue in Canada and, and laws are are different for Amazon Canada. And there is a way to navigate that process, but it's not quite as streamlined as as it is here in the U.S. Got it. Because I know we have some folks from Canada on the line as well. So got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what about so, targeting? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So targeting these unauthorized resellers once we know um, who and where they are, um, you know, it's, it's really a matter of vigilance and just kind of staying on top of it. So we have identified them and typically we're sending out cease and desist letters 
that explain our clients' rights, that their trademarks and copyrights are being infringed upon, that they're not authorized resellers, that they are misleading the uh, average consumer and probably selling them a product unbeknownst to the customer um, that, you know, as Alex talked about, many of the suite of services or the warranties do not apply in this instance. And depending upon the uh, nature of that seller, sometimes you get a response immediately back. We're sorry, we didn't realize this. We won't do it. We'll, we'll take our listings down. We'll return the product. We'll destroy the product. Um, typically, you see uh, maybe not a response initially. Um, we recommend kind of a regimen of three cease and desist letters, each tailored to that specific situation. Um, and depending on how problematic those resellers are, sometimes it, it becomes necessary to file a lawsuit in federal court, which is kind of the final step. Um, and this and then this ultimately comes a kind of a cost benefit analysis proposition for these resellers. What is it really worth to them to um, you know defend a lawsuit in a federal court somewhere in the United States where they're not located? Um, and and typically. The, the answer is it's probably not worth it. And, and of course, there's no guarantee when you're engaging in litigation how the case will resolve itself. But we typically see these cases resolve themselves very early on, um, really even prior to discovery. And we get a settlement agreement in place, which the seller agrees never to sell our products again in perpetuity or face significant penalties. So it's um, that's that's kind of the process, um, and hopefully we can get results with you know one or two cease and desist letters without having to take that initial or that that uh, final step of litigation. And we've also seen some success, John, on our side with before we even get into anything legal, including a cease and desist letter, just contacting the seller if there's a relationship, we know who they are as a first step to ask them to you know to to remove their listings and we've had some success with that as well even before we get into this right into yeah and it did, oftentimes depends on the, the level of the size of the seller or the level right. of sophistication typically right. when there's so many i think two point you said two and a half million was the statistic <laughs> of these sellers out there so yep. you can bet that most of them aren't particularly sophisticated um so typically they're they're apologetic uh they'll, they'll take them down we'll continue to monitor to make sure that they do what they say they're going to do Mm -hmm. And um, and that's and that's the end of it. But that's not often the case. Sometimes we get a very strongly worded letter in response from from legal counsel, often mm -hmm. citing the, um, the you know the first sale doctrine, for instance. And but typically that comes with, while we disagree with your position, we're we're going to agree to take them down for now. So, which we would yep. consider a win in most instances. Okay, awesome. Well, Michelle, I know you have some things you want to share here around brand registry because people often said well i just brand you know be, be brand registered and amazon will take all my all my uh all the resellers off of my listings but it's yeah. not that easy, is it? <laughs> it's not that easy so amazon does have some levers that they talk about as being able to leverage against third party sellers or an, as a way to protect your brand when in reality it's not that easy or uh not necessarily true so what brand registry is is it requires you to have the, the brand registry requirements are that you have a United States patent and trademark. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have branded product, branded packaging, and a branded domain name. So those are the requirements just to register to have a brand registry account to work within brand registry on Amazon. What it is or what you can do with it, it is great for ACE and merge research and execution. You can search by names, you can search by images uh, in order to find all of those items that sellers are selling on that could be merged under your ASIN instead of having multiple ASINs for the same item. And ASINs are Amazon standard identification number if you are unfamiliar. Uh, it presents brand content and imagery on all brand listings as applicable. It gives you access to having enhanced content and brand stores within Amazon. So your brand can look really great if you have a brand registry account. What it is not. It doesn't prevent sellers from selling your products, even if the brand owner um, has not authorized them as a reseller. It doesn't block sellers. It does not make Amazon responsible for any trademark infringement, um, or it does not make them in, it, any give them any responsibility to enforce trademark laws. And it does not guarantee buy box status. And buy box status, meaning that if you're selling the product, you win the buy box, right? Um, so it doesn't, just because your brand is registered doesn't mean you're going to, you're going to be the, the company that seller that wins the sale on Amazon, right? So nope. now what is transparency? Tell us about this. So transparency is a tool that Amazon has where you can actually enroll your products into the tool and Amazon will scan it as it comes into and goes out of the warehouse. So it gives some visibility to Amazon's warehouses 
um, as to authenticate products that are coming from the manufacturer. It also gives the end user the opportunity to authenticate products as they come to their house. Now, the thing about transparency that you have to remember is that as you enroll your products, so say you enroll at UPC in this program, you have to put these Amazon transparency stickers on every single item that you manufacture within that UPC. So that doesn't mean just the things you're shipping to Amazon. That means all of the items, regardless of where you're shipping it to. If Amazon finds that you're not putting that sticker on everything, they will unenroll that item from the program. And those stickers that you put on your products cost between one cent and five cents each just to buy the stickers. It does not include printing or applying of those mm -hmm. codes to the products themselves. So there's additional cost to the manufacturer for that. And so do you see, yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask you, do you see the main reason for transparency is, is really about counterfeit? In other words, making sure the product that's sold is actually the, the authentic product of the, of the brand. Is that, is that the primary use case? Yeah. Use case on this is definitely uh, for counterfeits. Got it. Some brands think, Oh, I'll just, it, I'll just put my products that I'm selling to Amazon, I'll put the stickers on those. And then Amazon won't accept the other ones. And they think that it's a way to kind of trick the system to be able to make sure that only their products are being sold on Amazon. It doesn't work that way. Ah, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, take us through the steps. Sure. So you enroll your products, you buy your codes and you apply them on your products. Amazon fulfillment scanners centers scan everything that comes in to ensure that only authentic units are being shipped then back out of the uh, centers to the product, to the customers. And that is an actual picture. I downloaded the app a couple of weeks ago. My daughter got a birthday gift <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, let's download the app. So if you didn't uh -huh. know, there's a whole app you have to download in order to even scan these codes. Mm -hmm. I've been working with Amazon for like 10 years. I've never downloaded the app. That's exactly what it showed me when I scanned that transparency app. It just said your product is, and then a picture of what the item was. That was, that was the whole experience. Interesting. So. Got it. Okay. So, and there's another program here too called Project Zero. What's the, what's this one? So Project Zero is also uh, designed to reduce fakes and counterfeits within Amazon. And Amazon has some statistics that they've provided, which is that over 6 million counterfeit goods were removed from Amazon in 2022. Uh, there's some automation that they have around Project Zero, and it's easy to go through and report products that you think could be counterfeit using this program. Um, so it gives the brands opportunities to identify those and have Amazon look into it. You do have to be registered uh, within brand registry. There are ongoing counterfeit checks done by Amazon and by the brand. Uh, enrollment is free. However, some of the pitfalls are if you want to just go in and try and mark every seller as counterfeit, and I've seen brands do this before, like all of this is counterfeit except for what I'm selling, you can lose access to Project Zero. You can lose access to brand registry. Wow. And if you abuse some of these tools within brand registry, you start to lose some of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. If you lose your brand registry account, remember, you lose your, your Amazon brand store you right. lose the opportunity to create uh, rich content that's customer facing. So if you're going to use these tools, make sure that you're using them legitimately for what they are for, um, not to just try and get rid of anyone that's selling your product on Amazon that is unauthorized. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting because, yeah, these tools sound great, but they, there you go. Deprioritize tickets, shut down your brand registry account. There's some real gotchas here. So. Wow. So that, that's great stuff, Michelle. Thank you. You know, one of the things that we find is that, you know, Amazon is companies know that Amazon is both, um, you know, uh, it can be a challenge as it relates to channel conflict and price degradation, but it can also be such a great opportunity for companies if it's approached correctly. And if you want to put Amazon to work for you versus against you, there's some fundamentals that we recommend and we put in place with our clients, um, often in partnership with KJK and, and Track Street. Um, great content is really important on Amazon. So this is true. Remember, and the stats aren't in here, guys, but 70 over 70% 70 of search on product in the United States now starts on Amazon. So maintaining a quality presence, which necessitates managing your resale network as well, it starts with great content. This is one of our clients, big ass fans. Um, so you may know this company. I love this, love the branding on this company. Anyway, descriptive title with benefits, great images, detailed descriptions, reviews, prime, 
these are all elements of success. I'm not our webinar today isn't about this necessarily, but I wanted to highlight it because it's important to uh, anytime we we have a channel management program, we recommend and always build in content and also search engine optimization aspects of Amazon because visibility is critical. I mentioned the 70% of product search starting. Um, and people only really look for and engage in products that are uh, on page one. There's 3 billion products on Amazon. You think about that. It's mind boggling. Um, unpaid search on Amazon can be, can be very profitable, more so than other channels like Google. Organic search is important. Promotions. These are some of the things that you as a seller will want to do and that your resellers obviously take advantage of too, right? When they're selling product. This is, and I'm just highlighting a couple points here in a, in a successful Amazon program. But what we what we talk about all this in the context of a really a, a an authorized for Amazon program, which for many of the manufacturers that we work with, some of you on the webinar today are clients of ours. It typically involves a combination of direct selling on Amazon and then selling in partnership with authorized resellers. But those resellers following a specific set of requirements that they must adhere to, to be part of the program. So some of this is documented, you know, we've worked with KJK and John and Alex and team to put specific requirements in place around some of these items. Um, for example, I'll list a couple of them here. The, the, the reseller must be holding a, a minimum stock position. They must be actively supporting your value proposition as a manufacturer, like participating in product training that there's channel diversity, that they're not only selling on Amazon. Again, these are criteria for resellers potentially. They're, they have a demonstrated capability to provide post-purchase support or even installation on your product, things of that nature. They're committing to advertising. They're agreeing to comply with your map and distribution policies. They're, they are demonstrating selling competency on Amazon. We'll often build in a minimum um, you know, sort of seller rating on Amazon into these uh, programs at least 90% positive, excuse me. Uh, so there's a whole variety of things here that, um, you know, that we, <clears throat> we recommend, including in a, an authorized for Amazon program, which again, includes often you selling directly as well as some of your resellers. A good example of this is our friend Trent, who's on the webinar uh, today. Hey, Trent, thanks for joining us. Um, uh, Trent is VP of, uh, uh, at Grasshopper, leading digital and marketing there. There, if any of you guys know this company, their their lawnmowers mow the lawns at the White House and across the country and the world. They have a dealer network. We help them authorize, implement an authorized for Amazon. Oops, uh, authorized for Amazon program, and also selling directly. They have a significantly uh, uh, fast growing Amazon channel selling directly. Seventy percent of their Amazon sales were determined to be purely incremental. So we talk about channel conflict. One of the things that often manufacturers are concerned about <clears throat> once they have control of the channel, if they want to sell directly, they're worried about channel conflict, how I defined it earlier. Well, in Trent's case, he found that a lot of these sales were happening outside of their traditional dealer base, beyond the reach of their traditional dealers. So a lot of these sales were incremental. And in fact, they got no complaints from their dealers about, about selling directly. So, you know, I, I, I put this, Amazon, there's so much fear uh, of Amazon. And, and when you take a controlled approach to the channel, somewhat counterintuitive, a proactive control approach of the channel will actually help you to, um, to reduce channel conflict. Uh, and, and you gain control of Amazon, not the other way around. So Michelle, let's talk about how you monitor. There's a number of tools that you guys um, um, you know, bring to market that, that are really powerful. Can you speak to some of that? Yeah, so it's important that you know where your products are being sold who's selling them and at what price they're being sold. So it's critical that you're looking at all types of policy violations, whether they are authorized or unauthorized sellers and whether you have a policy in place like a map policy or any kind of pricing policy, you can identify uh, what policies they are not adhering to and be able to take actionable and next steps within that policy. Awesome. Automation is important because we're all short on time and we have a lot of things to do. So fully customizable workflows and ways that the product can actually work for you are really important so that you're not spending all day approving notices or typing in manual notices or emailing out sellers, uh, emailing notifications to sellers saying, hey, you're not in compliance with our policy. So automation is key. 
Yeah, I find this actually, Michelle, with a number of our clients that, you know, they, it's it's automating some of these processes uh, really does help because, you know, in some cases we've had clients with hundreds of resellers, two, 300 resellers, trying to manage that and understand, you know, even how to communicate, um, you know, is it can be a, it can be a big challenge. It can be time consuming. And then also having metrics and actionable data that helps you grow the brand in the places where you want to grow it with the partners that you want to grow it with. So what is that white space and how do you expand those opportunities um, and, and make more money within those channels? Awesome. So we also have some monitoring tools that are applicable only to Amazon, which obviously Amazon is a marketplace that has 50% of all e-commerce sales. Uh, within the United States. So it's a top priority. Uh, this shows some of those metrics that uh, show buy box ownership by category, um, loss of buy box or loss of revenue to third party sellers or unauthorized sellers within uh, the marketplace within a certain time period. So this is just some of the metrics that we are able to uh, show our clients. One of the things I love about your tool too is that it just it, it can track down to individual sellers who they are, where they are. You know, some of the, obviously within the constraints, John, that you highlighted earlier. You know, some is not always accurate, but the uh, you know who, the, the the reseller name. But you guys get in there and and really give a lot of transparency to the channel, Michelle, which is so cool. We also have a team of investigators that goes and looks into those right those resellers where you can't get great information off of Amazon, so that they can try to find true identity uh, because. I don't know what your experience has been with the Inform Act, but it hasn't been incredibly informative since it took place uh, and went into law back in June. Absolutely. So, well, great. Well, thank you for that. And uh, John, I think you had you taken this one or is it Alex? I can I'll take this one. Um, I think just as we're wrapping up here, we just want to kind of to go over maybe some of the you know things That's to remember and that it. From our perspective, when I was talking about quality controls and warranty policies and reseller agreements, you know, that's kind of a broad stroke of, of how you're going to go about doing this. But it's important that you, you tailor all those policies specifically to your company, specifically to your policies, specifically to your products. Um, it's not a one size fits all approach. Uh, it really does need to be you know, geared towards how you are actually selling. And the more tailored it is, the stronger your claims are going to be. Um, I know we saw it. We had a question in here about warranty protection on food products. Yes. And so like I said, this is not, it's not a one size fits all approach. Generally speaking, food products, you're not going to offer a warranty. Um, so you're not going to do that. Uh, that doesn't mean you're, you're, you're done. You can't do anything, but Food products are actually, there should be a ton of quality controls. You should have expiration date controls and, and those types of things. So um, it's not like you need both quality controls and warranty procedures in order for it to work. Um, yeah, the storage and the shipping controls are particularly important. Yeah, you know, food, you know, products. food products like that. So again, it's a, it's a matter of tailoring the policy to your brand. Um, and that's just going to give you your best chance at, at, you know, getting, you know, clearing channel conflict. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great point. And you guys have a have a cool case study here. I think, John, you were going to take us through this. Yeah, and then really kind of just to piggyback off what Alex said about the best practice. I mean, the ultimate goal here really is to get these resellers taken down in you know a legally appropriate manner and take back control of your brand, protect your IP, and and really protect your profit margin and drive additional revenue. And you know, here's an example of a way in which we helped a, a client accomplish that. Um, Hinkley Lighting, a real premium brand and uh, you know, really one of the leaders in the industry for you know, high-end lighting fixtures. Mm -hmm. And they were facing uh, a challenge of, uh, from a, a group out of New York, New Jersey, that was kind of a scourge of the industry. They were, they were pretty notorious and nobody could really figure out how to crack them. And we were able to identify them. They were selling it both on Amazon as well as on their own proprietary website. And we're, we're getting critical mass of, of our clients inventory through various channels. And, you know, we're kind of flaunting the law and, and when we're really willing to um, cooperate on any level, we were able to identify where they were, who they were, and, and, and ultimately resulted in us having to file a lawsuit in federal court in the Northern wow. District of Ohio. And what we were able to get them to do very quickly after this case was filed was to sign a, a settlement agreement, agreeing to return all the product and never to sell again um, in any other entity that they might create. 
and kind of got an airtight result, which um, you know made made our client very happy, and and actually resulted in some of the other leaders in in the um, high end lighting fixture industry mm-hmm. to inquire as to because they were still selling other um, mm. other, other companies' products as well. So um, just kind of a way in which that you kind of see it come from from the beginning, but it wouldn't have really been possible without some of the upfront controls that we had helped them install. Um, as Alex talked about, kind of protecting the house initially from an IP front and from an, uh, you know, making sure you have really strong agreements in place before going out to actually enforce. Yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense. That's a great case study. Thank you. And uh, Michelle, I think you wanted to share something. Grizzly, what do these guys make? Pet products, right? Pet products. Pet parents are a passionate bunch, in case you didn't know. Um, <laughs> and so are the manufacturers that make those products. So uh, Grizzly is a leader in salmon oil supplements for dogs. And uh, pet has really been a place where a lot of, there's a lot of disruption in the pet industry. You think of all of the different ways that mm. um, these, these folks can get pet products. And you think of some of these off-channel, like TJ Maxx and Marshalls, where some of these things eventually end up too, um, that the manufacturers are not looking for. So these end up all over the internet um, all the time, because like I said, pet parents are a passionate bunch and they're always looking for the best deal on the stuff for their pets. So um this was disrupting Grizzly's uh, sales channels. So if you could go through a couple, click again, uh, two more times. Uh, so the solution was our market visibility, which is where we see who's selling, where are they selling in, what, what, at what price. Our mm-hmm. automated enforcement module, which helps to send out those notifications based on parameters that are put into the system. Mm-hmm. They are using our Amazon analytics and product review tracking modules. And the results for Grizzly was a 95% reduction in their minimum wow. average pricing policy violations. Awesome. It saved awesome. 14 hours plus of manual searching and yep. manual sending each week. Yep. Yep. Having done a lot of this myself, so I know uh, it's it's a lot of work uh, to you know police and and look at things, and we have clients doing this, and so yeah, that's that automation you provide is really helpful. So thank you for that. 60% increase in brick and mortar sales, which is where they wanted the products to be sold. So we do also have a quote if you click one more time. Oh yeah, there we go. Thanks. Uh, the platform, Track Street's platform automation automated much of our policy enforcement from sending emails to violators to automatically adding worst offenders to a do not sell list, which is a real game changer for us. And that do not sell list then acts as your triage list for where you want to look to start your cease and desist process. And, you know, that's actually raises a really good point, Michelle, because the, you know, that, that um, <clears throat> adding the, the, that last thing in that quote, do not sell list is really interesting. And folks um, that are on the call and the webinar here, you know, one of the things you have to make sure you have, and it's a hidden gotcha. I have it on my last slide here. We're going to get to in a second and we'll answer some questions, but internal alignment is really important. If you're going to do this successfully, you have to have the organizational stomach to enforce this. What does do not sell mean? It means you're not going to sell them anymore. Well, what happens if we've got two-step distribution or we have you know, other folks that are, you know, the other ways are getting the product? Well, your sales team has to be aligned to your effort here. You, and which is why I found, and you know, love to hear from uh, Michelle, John, and Alex, you know, and starting making sure that the top level management in your company is behind this effort and is helping to coordinate this your head of sales, your VP of sales, your CEO, people like that. That if that's not in place, I've seen it really bite the effectiveness of these programs, um, you know, badly. Yeah. Any thoughts on that, guys? Yeah, really do what you do what you say you do internally, and whether that's a warranty program that's in place, and, and but it, make sure you're following it because right. that's going to be that's going to become very relevant um, from the enforcement end. Make sure you're actually tracing if, if you have a tracing program in place if you have uh, if you're requiring your authorized dealers to um, re- tell you where they're selling the product or not rely on um, liquidators to uh, sell excess inventory make sure that you are actually following the practices that you have in place it's not just enough to to have them um, in name only yeah yeah then having a sales team that's aligned to that is super important because if you have salespeople that are that are highly commissioned, it's difficult to say you can no longer sell to A, B, and C. So making sure that that alignment is in place internally is really paramount to making sure that these types of policies work and that you get that kind of 60% increase in sales at brick and mortar where you want those sales to be. 
-hmm. it requires that internal alignment with your sales team. Yeah, no, those are some fantastic results. So, so a couple quick quick takeaways, guys, and then we'll get to, we have a few questions that have come in, which are great. Thank you all for submitting those. Um, you know, there's, there's, as we've seen, as you all said, <laughs> we don't necessarily have control here of this channel that's Amazon and it's an enormous and pervasive channel counterintuitively a proactive program is actually the way to gain control and reduce channel conflict. And, you know, we talked about the three P pricing approach, which gives greater control. If you are going to sell versus one P brand registry is not the complete solution. It's a portion of it. It's a leg of the stool. A legal foundation is more of that. And then we've got transparency and project zero, which can help with counterfeit um, controlling brand and product content is really necessary if you want to have a fully robust authorized for Amazon program. And then of course, monitoring and proactive enforcement is, is critical as we've just gone through. Here's the gotcha, internal alignment must be in place. That's really critical uh, for success as we've just described. So, so we'd love to speak with you afterwards. If you have questions, any one of us is available to you, our name and phone number, uh, emails and LinkedIn's and everything else is on this slide here. I hope you grab those. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thanks, John, Alex, and Michelle. You guys did a fabulous job today. And um, we covered a lot in an hour and appreciate your time. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you on our next uh, webinar. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great day.